Right, so thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak at this mini workshop. So today in this talk there will be no results about uh, resurgence, but this talk will be about integers which are supposed to play a role in resurgence. So things like number of gradient flow lines between critical points, so if you're on stock indices, mm. and the like. And one of the main points of this talk is that these numbers, these integers, often have very have various physical or geometrical interpretations. So for example, we heard various talks about Chan Simons, and in different talks, or even inside the same talks, we heard that these integers could be count of BPS state, and so three-dimensional quantum field theory, or there might be counts of solutions to some waffa witten equation, or kapustin witten equation, or there might be counts of holomorphic disks in some holomorphic symplectic manifold. And in this talk, we'll discuss these kind of various interpretations, not in the context of chan simons theory, but in the context of, let's say, non-compact Calabio threefold, which is a context very close to the one in the talks by Iwaki and Marino. So in particular, we'll talk about these two uh, geometric uh, uh, numbers, DT invariance and uh, holomorphic curves. Okay, so on one side, we'll talk about donaldson thomas invariance, DT invariance, of non-compact Calabio threefolds, which geometrically has to do with count of current sheaves or complex of current sheaves on some non-compact Calabio threefold X, which are stable in an appropriate sense. Or from a mirror point of view, it might be something about counting special Lagrangian sum manifolds of some mirror non-compact Calabio threefold Y. And from a physics point of view, these numbers are supposed to be related to so-called counts of BPS states in some n equal to supersymmetric four-dimensional field theory, which is obtained from 10-dimensional string theory compactified on your non-compact Calabio threefold. So this thing is the first side of the story, and the second side is about holomorphic curves in some hypercalor manifold, more precisely some complex integrable system. And in some uh, physics language, this thing is related to the physical theory. This M is a Coulomb branch of this theory on R3 cross S1. Or it is a subject written integrable system associated to this physical theory. Okay, so the plan of my talk is first to say a few words about the kind of general picture or general expectation, which is roughly in a paper by Kontri Sommerman on wall crossing structures for complex integrable systems. And then the art of this talk will be about some concrete example in which it will be possible to prove such comparison between on one side his donaldson thomas invariance coming from geometry of Calabio threefolds, and on the other side some holomorphic curves or holomorphic disks in some holomorphic uh, symplectic geometry. And in this specific example, the non-compact Calabio threefold will be so-called local P2. So I will always note by X local P2. It's a total space of the canonical line bundle, the line bundle O minus 3 over the complex projective plane uh, P2. Okay, so it has a compact part, complex projective plane, and it's a total space of a line bundle over it, which form a non-compact complex dimension 3 geometry. So it's one side of the story, and the other side, the, where we will consider holomorphic curves or holomorphic disks, I will denote by curly M. It is some um, complex integral system, it is some um, hyperkalea uh, geometry, and depending on which complex structure you look at it, it might look quite different. So in one complex structure I, it will look like a complex integral system as an elliptic fabrication. So this thing will be of complex dimension 2, just the holomorphic uh, symplectic uh, surface, non-compact. So in one complex structure, it is an elliptic uh, fabrication, family of elliptic curves with possibly singular fibers over just complex plane. And in some different complex structures that I denote by J, it is actually an affine surface, and it's a complement of a smooth elliptic curve E inside the projective plane. Okay, so it's a non-compact hypercalar uh, geometry, and in the kind of rough classification of such objects, it's a so-called ALH star hypercalar uh, metric. And so I will talk about relations between these two kinds of numbers, the one extracted from this Calabio threefold and the one extracted from this Apercalia geometry. And I will only briefly mention the relation to the fact that 
These numbers are expected to be related to resurgence properties of so-called quantum periods of a difference equation, which is a so-called quantum mirror curve for this uh, geometry. And at the very end, I will give some kind of heuristic physics derivation of this kind of marginal correspondence, which involve holomorphic flow theory. So you already heard in the talk by Konsevich and Sommerman that holomorphic flow theory is a nice setup where resurgence uh, should come from. And this setup, these integer stock indices we care about are naturally related to some counts of uh, holomorphic disks. And so the story I want to explain heuristically is why you should expect these dt invariants coming from Calabria of three folds to be related to this kind of holomorphic disks in this particular geometry, and then which then somehow is a natural explanation for why these numbers should control some resurgence problems. Okay, so I start by the kind of uh, first general overview of both sides. So the dt invariants will be some integers that will always denote by omega, gamma of u. And the account of some uh, geometric objects on the Calabria of threefold x, with so they are indexed by some discrete parameter gamma, which live in the lattice z n, which roughly prescribes the topology of your uh, geometric objects. And we want these objects to be stable in an appropriate sense. And the stability parameter is called u. So maybe it's a regional stability condition, and it's a continuous uh, parameter. Okay, so for example, we could talk about stable homomorphic vector bundles, some more generally objects in the RF category of current sheaves of a given chain character gamma, where the stability is prescribed by some Keller class or Keller parameter u on your Calabria threefold. Or from a mirror point of view, you might be talking about special Lagrangian sum manifolds of a given homology class gamma, and where it's special with respect to some uh, holomorphic volume form corresponding to a complex moduli u. Okay, so this thing is a geometric side of the story, and there is a physics reformulation of it. Uh, if you start with something like an n-ego-2 supersymmetric four-dimensional field theory, then attached to such object, whatever it is, there should be a Coulomb branch B, which should be a complex manifold, which in many examples is just an r-dimensional complex plane, complex space. And then the parameter u will live in this Coulomb branch B, or precisely in the complement of some discriminant locus delta of complex uh, dimension one. And then if you take a point u in this b uh, minus delta, then there should be a space h gamma of u of so-called BPS states of given charge gamma uh, for this particular point u. And then there should be a BPS index, which is a few trace or super trace over this uh, vector space. And there is an expectation that the geometric story and the physics story uh, should be related. <coughs> that if you start with a Calabria threefold, you consider type 2 or type 2 with string theory on it, you will produce some four dimensional uh, theory. And so there are then several uh, expectations. The first one is that the universal cover of this Coulomb branch, B minus delta minus the discriminant locus, should have a natural map to the space of mathematically reasonable the bridge on stability conditions on, uh, on the category of geometric objects you consider as a uh, current sheaves or Lagrangians. And then the expectation is that under this correspondence, the DT invariants geometrically defined match with uh, the BPS numbers, BPS indices, where the U parameter stability on the DT side match with a point, corresponding point on uh, the Coulomb branch. And from now on, we'll only consider four-dimensional theory without any gravity in physics language, which geometrically just means we consider non-compact Calabria threefold. Okay, so some key property of this number, omega gamma of u, is that they satisfy some, uh, they have some wall crossing behavior, they are constant function of u, away from real co-dimension one loci in B, called walls across and across these walls, this omega gamma of u jumps uh, discontinuously. And the jumps across the wall is controlled by a universal wall crossing formula due to Konsevich and Sabama. So here is a kind of very uh, simple picture. In the case where this B has complex dimension one, it's just a complex plane. This delta, this discriminant locus, just consists of two points. 
And here I draw a picture where in red I draw two walls to real code dimension one. A loci, which in this example divides the plane into two chambers. And in some specific example, you might have one set of uh, DT invariants of BPS tests in the interior chamber and a different set in the outside chamber, and the two are related by the wall crossing formula. And this thing is a very uh, simple picture where only you have two chambers. In general, in more complicated examples, the true picture is much more complicated, and we'll see later uh, much more complicated uh, pictures. Okay, so this thing was some very rough overview of the DT side of the story. And the other side is about holomorphic curves in this kind of complex uh, integrable system. And let's say from a physics point of view, each time you have these four-dimensional n equal two series, there is attached to it some hyperkähler manifold of complex dimension 2R, if R was the dimension of this Coulomb branch, and which is a complex integral system, which means it has a map to this Coulomb branch B. And because it's hyperkähler, it has a twister sphere of compatible complex structures that are denoted by I, J, K, which forms some kind of quaternionic triple. And then the notation is such that its map pi is holomorphic in complex structure I. And the fact that it's a complex integral system means that uh, generic fibers are abelian varieties of uh, dimension R. Okay, so in one complex structure, this map is holomorphic, the fibers are holomorphic subvarieties. But in some different complex structures, the picture will look different. In particular, if I fix a theta, an angle, and if I consider the complex structure the J theta, which are some linear combination of complex structure J and K with coefficient cosine theta and sine theta, so J and K are orthogonal to I, then with respect to C structure, the fibers will be special Lagrangians. Okay, so in one complex structure, it looks like some holomorphic vibration. With respect to a different one, it looks like some real Lagrangian uh, vibration. And from a physics point of view, uh, the characteristic property of this hyperkähler manifold is that it describes a low energy three dimensional. A theory that you obtain by compactifying your four-dimensional theory on, on a circle. Okay? So this thing is our hyperkähler geometry. I will give some examples uh, very soon. And to match it with the other side, I need to explain how the parameters are related. So from the point of view of this picture, the space of stability parameter, or let's say Coulomb branch B, is just a base of this integral System. So the point U, which was appearing before, is just a point in the base of this vibration. So if you want, it's fixing a fiber of uh, this map. And the set of uh, possible uh, classes gamma in this picture is some kind of homology of pair. Or here I wrote uh, pi 2, so a relative second homotopy group of M relatively to the fiber uh, over U. So as we'll see in one moment, it's exactly the space where classes of holomorphic disk in M with boundary on the fiber over U uh, are living. And then uh, out of this data, you can cook up a central charge, Z gamma of U, simply by the period of the holomorphic symplectic form omega I over this kind of, of classes. And the expectation is that this central charge is used in the data of the corresponding mathematical stability uh, condition. Okay, so here is a rough uh, picture of an integral system over the base P. And over the discriminant delta, you get singular uh, fibers. Okay, so an example is that for so-called theory of class S, then this thing is essentially some Hitchin uh, integrable uh, system. Okay. Another kind of uh, general expectation is that if you fix a point U in this space away from the discriminant locus, and if you fix a class gamma, then here it's slightly, maybe in a slightly vague way, the formula is not supposed to be maybe so precise, but you should have some relation between, on the one side, this omega gamma of u that I already introduced, which are these donaldson thomas or BPS invariants, which are about counting u-stable objects of class gamma, so it's something which has to do with counting geometric objects on the Calabi-Oss 3 fold. 
And on the other, uh, on the other side of this equation, I have something I called n gamma of u. And this n gamma of u is supposed <laughs> to be some count of holomorphic disk in M. But because M is hyperkähler, I need to be careful holomorphic with respect to which uh, complex structure. And it should be uh, holomorphic with respect to the complex structure J theta. So there are holomorphic disks in M with boundary on the fiber sitting over the point U of class gamma. And this particular angle theta is, should be determined by the central charge. It should simply be roughly the phase the argument of the central charge. And so you can check that somehow, uh, you know, some very basic check. So as I described with respect to any of the complex structure J theta, the fibers are like Lagrangian. So we are counting holomorphic curve with boundary on some Lagrangian, with Lagrangian boundary conditions, which are the usual counting problem, which uh, makes sense. OK, so there are various uh, pieces of evidence for it. Maybe I would just uh, uh, skip that and go directly to first the obvious problems to make this picture uh, precise, and then a concrete example where we can make it precise and actually prove this kind of comparison. OK, so there are various problems. One of them is that the embedding of this base of your complex integral system in some space of Bridgian stability stabi condition is known in a few examples, but in many interesting examples where it should be true, it's not known. And the related problem is that actually making sense of count of holomorphic disk is in general difficult. So yesterday we heard in Gukov talk about non-compactness problems. So in general, in fluid theory, you have a non-compactness problem. And so you need to think about how you define precisely uh, these numbers. And in what I will talk about, we'd use some in the specific examples I will describe, we'll use some particular approach to see this problem. And we'll use so-called log chromov witter invariants, which have the advantage to be purely uh, algebra or geometric objects. They're really made of algebraic curves, for which you can use standard techniques of algebraic geometry to cook up modulus spaces and extract numbers out of them. But they are uh, algebra uh, geometric algebra geometrically defined numbers, which are supposed to capture the would-be uh, counts of holomorphic disks. And in particular, it is an approach which has been used by uh, Gross and Zubert in their mirror symmetry construction. So in, um, in the general mirror symmetry construction for a Calabria threefold, you are supposed to exploit some kind of torus vibration structure and to take into account some kind of count of holomorphic disks, so exactly the kind of numbers we are talking about. And there is an algebra geometric way to view this problem, which uses this log chromov witter invariant. So I will not go through any details of that, but just to say it is the definition I will use when I state a precise uh, result. So actually, there are other examples of such correspondence between, on one side, DG invariants and count of holomorphic disks, precisely defined through log chromov witter invariants. For example, the, it's possible to state some correspondence between DT invariants also called quivers with potential. So they are not invariants of a geometric non-compact Calabrio threefold, but defined using some more algebraic uh, starting point. You can prove a correspondence between these kind of counts and some logarithmic gromov with invariants of some toric or cluster varieties. It's some joint work I did with Rydia Harkus. Okay, so but in this talk, I will consider a different example which has the advantage to be about some geometrical story. I will talk about DT invariants of current sheaves on this non-compact Calabria threefold local P2. And the reason why I'm restricted to this particular uh, geometry is that it's one of the few examples where for this geometry, the expected embedded of the base of this integrable system into the space of bridge on stability conditions is known. Okay, maybe I can stop there if there are any questions. This thing was like the general overview. And then I will start describing this more specific uh, example. OK? If not, I'll start uh, saying more precisely the setting I will consider. So x will be local P2, so total space of the line bundle O minus 3, the canonical line bundle of P2. It's a non-compact uh, Calabria threefold, which contains inside the P2 itself as a zero section. And here, the relevant category is a bounded Dirac category of current sheaves on P2. 
And I will only consider the ones which are set theoretically supported on P2. So they all live beyond infinitesimally near of the zero section. And as particular object in this category, I will denote by O of n, simply the shift coming from the standard line bundle O of n on P2, that I view them as being supported on the zero section inside this three-dimensional uh, geometry. So in physics language, they are really default brains. They are only supported on P2, they are zero outside. And for this particular non-compact uh, calabasas series fold, the kind of expected uh, integral system, the kind of corresponding saber witten geometry is known or predicted. And uh, in this case, the um, Coulomb branch B minus the discriminant locus has some kind of explicit description as some modular curve. It will be quotient of the upper half plane, standard upper half plane, uh, divided by the action of a congruent subgroup, gamma 1 of 3, some discrete group, subgroup of SL2Z. And then the corresponding integral system would just be the universal family of elliptic curves over this modular curve. Okay, every point of the upper half plane corresponds to an elliptic curve. And here we just take a quotient of the upper half plane. Uh, above it, you have a corresponding family of elliptic curve. What is genus of? Ah, and as we'll see, uh, this thing is just genus zero, okay. so which is particular. And how many cusps? Uh, yeah, so, so, so uh, here is a picture. So there are two cusps. So, so here is a picture of a fundamental domain for this uh, modular curve. And in this picture, there is two cusps, one which is at infinity, which maybe in some mirror symmetry language is a large volume point. And there is another one which is here at zero, which is called the conifold point. And then in addition, uh, there is a special point O, which has a non-finite stabilizer, O, which is called the orbifold point. So after quotienting in genus zero, it's some kind of sphere with three special points on uh, this sphere. Okay, so in particular, this example, this base B is really complex dimension one, and the M is a family of elliptic curve over it, so the total space is really complex uh, dimension two. And more, so this thing is just some very small uh, technical aspect rather than to work on this B we'll just work on a 3 to 1 cover of it to resolve the orbifold points. So that now uh, the B will really be like somehow smooth away from the two cusps. And if I do that on this 3 to 1 cover, these previous uh, conifold points live into three, three uh, singularities. So I will have three, my discriminant will consist of three points. And this family of elliptic curve will be smooth away from these three points. And at each of these three points, there will be simply a nodal uh, elliptic curve. Okay, so this geometry, algebra geometrically, is very simple. It's just an uh, elliptic vibration with uh, three uh, nodal singular fibers. And the point of this example is that some of the kind of general expectation that the base of the integral system should have a map, natural map, to the space of Brigeon safety conditions. In this example, it's known by some work of Bayer and Macri. So there is really a map from the universal cover of this base, which is simply the upper half plane. And there is a map from there to this space of stability conditions on the derived category of uh, current sheaves. So really for every point tau in the upper half plane, there is a data of some abelian subcategory L of tau inside this triangulated category. And if you put on it the expected chantal charge made of periods of the holomorphic volume form for this holomorphic symplectic geometry, then it indeed satisfies the axiom of Brigeon stability condition. In particular, once you have that, you can do Donaldson Thomas uh, theory, you can consider moduli spaces of stable or <coughs> semi-stable objects. So if I fix gamma, some class of uh, my objects so on P2, the cohomology of P2 is three-dimensional. So gamma would just be a vector in Z3, three integers. And if I fix such gamma, and if I fix the point tau in this base, it's more precisely in the upper half plane, then I can consider the moduli space M gamma tau of objects which are stable 
with respect to this point tau, given this embedding, in C is Abelian subcategory of given class gamma. Okay, so you have well-defined modulus spaces, and from these modulus spaces, you can extract some numbers, which are honestly defined uh, dt invariant omega gamma of tau. And in this picture, the wall crossing appear for this integer, or do they depend on this point tau in the modular curve, or more precisely on the upper half plane, which is a universal cover? Yes. So how is Vulcan A defined? Ah, yeah, that's right. So this thing I did not uh, explain. Oh, I see. So okay. somehow it's part of the uh, theorem of biomachery. There is a way to construct such a thing so that it makes sense. So precisely, just, uh, just uh, in this case, it's not so complicated. It's just one tilt of the standard uh, current sheaves inside the of category of current sheaves. I'm doing the sense that here we have just one complex parameter, but two others, it's J to R, which you have to this, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm only looking to a, to a like some kind of slice inside it, and in my we don't really see everything. But yeah, the gel 2 r is act actually acting. So maybe if mathematically you care about all possible points in the space of stability condition, but you don't lose you don't lose informations. Yes. Uh, but what what goes wrong in like other cases? Like look at the pet. So uh, if you define a stability condition from the integrals of a cyber written differential. Yeah, that's right. So definitely it's expected the same thing should be true. I think just it does not be proved that they satisfy the, 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 the expected conditions. OK, so yeah. Just so there's a proof of this thing with some knowledge about sheaves on P2 and local P2. And, and you need to have similar knowledge for that pezzo. So it, it's sure that this term should be true, but I don't think it has been done yet. Okay, so here, okay, so here these numbers are defined, and the main point of this talk would be to explain that in at least in some cases, these numbers, which here are described in terms of sheaves on P2, there are some alternative description in terms of holomorphic curves. So maybe algebra geometric version of the expected count of holomorphic curves in these uh, holomorphic, symplectic, or hypercalar geometry. And here I just have a single size for why you should care about these numbers from the resurgence point of view, which is a topic of uh, this workshop. So in this story, there is a so-called mirror curve, which actually is just some, um, uh, so here I wrote h p of x, so just some explicit equation, where e to the x, e to the p as in c star squared. So this thing is just an algebraic curve in c star squared which depend on tau through some explicit function, z of tau, that I did not write down. And actually, this curve is almost exactly the fibers of this uh, integral system, or precisely if I have a point tau, this corresponding elliptic curve, it's just some compactification of this algebraic curve in c star squared. This algebraic curve in c star squared is non-compact, but if you add three points to it at infinity, you get a compact elliptic curve which are exactly the fibers of the integral system. And then out of such a mirror curve, you can produce a from the quantum mirror curve. And maybe in general, there might be some ambiguity for how to do it. So maybe there is a more conceptual explanation. But yeah, I just took the, the one predicted by physicists, which one should be the correct one. So, so you, so you x becomes the operator multiplication by x, p becomes the operation of derivation with respect to x. So e to the x is just multiplication by e to the x, and e to the p would be translation. So you get some uh, difference equation, and I wrote here this difference equation for a function psi of x. And when you have such a difference equation, in the same way that if you have a differential equation, depending on a small parameter h bar, you can write down some wkb solution, you look for psi of x of the form exponential of 1 over h bar integral from a path starting somewhere to x of some one form, lambda of h bar. And you might look for such lambda of h bar as a formal power series in h bar. Okay, so the, the leading term would just be the natural, uh, like Liouville one form. But then you will have a correction that you can compute order by order. If you just plug in this thing into this expression, you will get some explicit recursions, and you can get some uh, formal power series. And then, so you can write it in terms of this one form, and out of this one form, you can cook up so-called quantum periods, 
which are just periods of these one forms along the basis of cycles on this curve, or elliptic curve. And you will get formal power series in, in H bar. And then the kind of uh, general expectation, so I guess probably in Iwaki's talk there was uh, closely related objects. The general expectation is the resurgence of this formal power series in H bar should be controlled somehow by the BPS spectrum, omega, gamma of tau. Okay, so here, in this problem, let's say you fix tau, you fix a point, you fix your curve, then you have one uh, resurgence problem, and the claim is that this thing should be controlled by this BPS invariance, omega, gamma of tau, for all possible gammas. Okay, so in particular, like the position of the singularities of the Borel resummation should be the values of the central charge for the gamma such that this thing is non-zero and things like that. Okay, so I don't think it's an example it's understood uh, at all. So I guess there is some work by Gu and Marino where they do some numerics of Borel resummation of this thing and see some pattern, but as far as I understand, even the precise statement of what should be true is not fully understood. Okay, so this thing is just some advertisement size for why you might care about these numbers if you care about resurgence for these kind of uh, problems. Okay, so to be able to relate these uh, DT invariants, omega, gamma of tau, which are defined geometrically, to be able to relate them to something like holomorphic curves, we like a way to study these numbers, to compute them somehow. And we will uh, compute them by organizing the information that they contain in a specific way. Okay, and the way in which the information will be encoded will be in some scattering diagram or, if you want, wall crossing uh, structure. So if you pick, so the way the information is organized is you first pick a phase, a theta, and for a given theta, you will draw a picture. And the picture is drawn as follow for every class gamma. You can consider all the points in the upper half plane, which is our space of parameter in this example. You look to all the points in this upper half plane, where, first of all, the central charge at gamma at this point has phase theta. Okay, so this thing is a real co-dimension one condition. Okay, the, if you want, if you fix gamma, that gamma of tau is some holomorphic function on this. Uh, upper half plane and you just look to the locus where the value complex number happens to be your phase theta. And furthermore, as the corresponding DT invariance at this point is a non-zero. Okay, so in this picture in general, this locus where the central charge of a given phase is some kind of line in the upper half plane, like real line. And this locus will be a particular sub-locus of this real line. Maybe at some point of this line, the invariant is zero. I don't include these points, and at some other point, the invariant will be non-zero, and then I include them. And uh, I orient uh, these lines, or these rays, uh, such that the absolute value of the sort of charge increase when I go following the orientation. And then you get a picture where you draw all possible rays in this picture, and to each point on such a ray, you attach the like numerical information of all the DT invariants of the given charge at this given point, if you want to in the form of a generating series. So here is a picture. For example, you can take gamma to be the class of O. So this is line bundle supported on P2. You can compute this function, then gamma of tau, and see where. Uh, and here I pick a specific theta. I guess I took theta equal pi over 2. You can ask, where is the central charge for this object purely imaginary? And you will get a line in this picture, which is uh, this line, uh, sorry, this line here. So this cusp is pointing the screen and on point. Yeah, that's right. So when I go to the upper half plane, this cusp exactly corresponds to the discriminant locus. Yes. And so indeed, so this line you see somehow come from the discriminant locus, and it's related to the fact that, uh, yeah, at this point, the central charge goes to zero. And you can do the same thing, for example, for O minus 1, shifted by 1 in the Dirac category, and you'll get this other line coming from, if you want, a different copy of the cusp in the upper half plane. 
or you can look to the structure sheaf uh, of a line, so just a line in P2. You can take the structure sheaf of this object, it's just the sheaf supported on a line. And if you draw the corresponding picture, it will be some half line, some half line starting here and going vertically uh, like that. And maybe so some comments. The point of this picture is that it's encoded some of the wall crossing behavior of these numbers. So somehow in this picture we'll not draw the walls where the invariant jump, but somehow this information is simply encoded in the intersection points of these rays. Because if you have at an intersection point of two rays, it means we have one class gamma one where z gamma one has phase theta. There's another class gamma 2, where z gamma 2 also has phase theta here. So you have two classes, gamma 1, gamma 2, where the two ch central charges have the same phase, which is exactly the condition where you could have some non sure wall crossing. So here, actually, it's what is happening somehow on this picture, there is some walls which is not drawn passing through this intersection point. And you see below this wall, the structure shift of a line is not stable. <coughs> there is no vertical line going down beyond this point, but uh, on the other side, it is stable. And somehow it has been produced as an extension of these two elementary objects. Okay, so here I draw a small piece of the full picture, and you might ask, what is the full picture, or how do you produce uh, the full picture? And the theorem, which is, I guess, related to uh, Jan's question is that uh, for every phase theta, this picture, d theta, with the corresponding numerical information, can be uniquely reconstructed from some explicit initial rays which come from these conifold points, which will be version of these lines coming from conifold points or discriminant locus in the fabrication picture. And then by uh, scattering, when two rays intersect, there will be some algorithm to produce new rays, which is so essentially the contrary sum of manual crossing formula. And the claim is that given this explicit initial data and then this scattering algorithm, you can uniquely reconstruct uh, the full picture at any point in the upper half plane. Here is an explicit description of what are exactly the initial rays. So in the original picture, uh, there was like in the discriminant locus maybe have three uh, conifold points like discriminant locus was consisting of three points but when i go to the upper half plane i get actually infinite mini conifold points on the real axis which actually are dense there they are like all rational numbers satisfying some congruence condition and for every uh, such a point from every uh, such a point uh, so for example if this point happens to be the point zero which is one of the conifold points, then out of this point, there are infinity rays uh, going out, with geometry correspond to the line model O on P2, and all is shift in the DRF category. So I just have a Z worth of initial rays corresponding to O and all is shifts. And the most general conifold point is obtained uh, from zero by applying an element in gamma one of three, and then O is replaced by a spherical objects in the DRF category of current sheaves. Okay, so you can show that this gamma one of three, which acts geometrically on this upper half plane, it also acts on the DRF category of current sheaves by auto equivalence. And uh, you can uh, take this element, apply it to O, you will get a new object in the DRF category, which will be a, an example of a spherical object. And so somehow at every conifold point, there will be a corresponding object there, E, and then there will be, starting from this point, infinity initial lines corresponding to these objects and all these possible shifts. Okay, so some of the claim is that uh, the full picture can just be reconstructed from this kind of explicit, yeah, and something I did not say is that these objects are spherical, so with the corresponding modulus spaces just consist of a single point. So for all of these objects, the corresponding DT invariant is just equal to one, which is as simple as possible. And then everything else is algorithmically reconstructed uh, from it. So here is some explicit picture where theta is pi over two, so it's some kind of extension of the picture I already drew. 
So for this particular angle, there is something simple happening that if you only care about this upper union of fundamental domains, then you, the only initial thing which contributes are the one coming from the conifold points at the integer points on the real axis, which correspond roughly to the line bundle O of n. The one corresponding to the other conifold points, they always stay in these regions and never go into this upper region. So if you only care about the region up, you only care about these initial line bundles. And then you can draw the picture. When two of them uh, intersect, the new rays are produced. And then you can iterate this picture, for example, from this ray produced here and this ray produced here, they intersect again, and you get a much more a complicated uh, picture. But the same things will appear in this blue regions. Yeah, yeah, yeah exa exactly. So, in, so, so there are like infimini fundamental domains, and, and the full picture is like gamma 1 of 3 uh, covariance. So, yes, yeah, this kind of picture will appear like infimini times inside the blue. Uh, blue, uh, blue domain. And here is a picture for a different angle for theta equal to, to zero, where actually yeah, the picture looks quite different and actually much simpler. Here things are quite degenerate somehow. So here what's going on is that, uh, for example, if I see three conifer point here at zero, minus one half, minus one, they all go to the orbifold point. So here is some kind of non-generic situation. Maybe generically two lines at a point, we have only two lines intersecting. But here it's like non-generic. There is three lines intersecting at the same point. And at this point, when they intersect, they produce these blue rays. But then afterwards, these blue rays never intersect again. They go straight to infinity. So actually in this picture, everything is happening, all the scattering is happening around these or before point. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so, so, so this thing is related to the fact that, yeah, this thing is like an exceptional uh, collection, these three things. The step T condition at this point has some kind of quiver uh, description mm -hmm. um, corresponding to the corresponding quiver with three vertices, three arrows, three arrows, three arrows, with some specific potential. And then the invariants which appear here are just DT invariant of this quiver. And so here, if you want, the statement is that for particular classes, there is no walls between the, some stable objects which are natural from the quiver point of view and some stable objects which are natural from the kind of more geometric point of view. And actually, a version of this statement in some way was known in the 80s in the paper of Dresel Le Potier, where they prove some modus space of current sheets on P2 are exactly equal to modus space of quiver representations. And yet, it's just a pictorial version of this argument. It just, there is no walls between the two. And you can show the, the classes for which the corresponding rays appear in this picture are exactly the classes which appear in the original Dresel Le Potier uh, result. Okay, and so I draw for pi over two and for zero, and they are quite different. And if you vary theta between them, you get a lot of transitions and complicated uh, things happening. Okay, so now, so now that we have this kind of picture, we somehow capture the the DT invariants, and somehow they capture the wall crossing behavior of the geometric DT invariants. And now we like to map them with holomorphic curves. And so I remember the general expectation is that if you, that uh, this picture is a base of a family of elliptic curve. It's a universal cover of the base of this complex integral system. And so if I pick a phase a theta, and if I look at this scattering diagram theta, which contain information about objects where the central charge has phase theta, the so expectation is that this picture should capture holomorphic curves, let's say holomorphic disks, which are holomorphic with respect to the complex structure J of theta. Okay, each picture for each different theta should capture holomorphic curves for different complex structure on this hyperkeller uh, geometry. And in general, to make it explicit, it's a bit difficult because if you have some hyperkeller manifold, this might be difficult. Even <coughs> if you know it in one complex structure explicitly, it might be difficult to say, to describe explicitly the complex structure in some hyperkeller rotated 
a complex structure. So here we'll do it for two specific points where we happen to know some kind of algebraic geometric description of the complex structure. So there is, by construction, the way I presented the geometry is as an elliptic fabrication. So there's an obvious complex structure here that I call complex structure I, for which this fabrication is um, holomorphic. And uh, there are some results. So, so Collins, Jacob Lin actually quite recently uh, studied explicitly this kind of hypercalar matrix and compare various hypercalar matrix constructions to get this kind of, of results. So the claim will be that if theta is equal to pi over two, then for the corresponding complex circle J of pi over two, the corresponding complex manifold is an affine algebraic variety. So it's no longer something like an elliptic fabrication. It's an affine variety and it's a complement of a smooth cubic in the projective plane. And for this complex structure, the elliptic fabrication is now a Lagrangian torus fabrication. Okay, so actually topologically it's quite easy to see that if you start with a projective plane, maybe with a toric description of the projective lane, plane, in the complement of three lines, you have C star squared. And C star squared has some kind of smooth torus fabrication. Like C star squared topologically just R2 cross T2. But somehow if you deform your three lines in P2 to an elliptic curve, each smoothing of a corner introduces a single fiber in this torus fabrication. So it's uh, quite clear, at least topologically, that this geometry has a torus fabrication with three single fibers. And it's also easy to check topologically that it's a correct topology to match to the other side. And the kind of non trivial statement is that actually this particular complex variety is actually in the same hypercalar family than the, than the elliptic fabrication. And actually, if you look to what happened for theta equal to zero, uh, you You've, somehow you find back the original elliptic fabrication, which is maybe something which is a bit strange, which does not happen, or I guess does not really happen if you look to things like each in system. Maybe for each in system, for one complex structure, you have some integral system. And maybe for all the other, you get things which I think as, as complex manifolds are like something like character writing, maybe affine like things. So here, yes, this particular geometry is not a modus space of uh, Higgs bundle. Actually, it's a modus space of doubly periodic monopoles, if you want this kind of description. And actually, there is two points where you have an elliptic fibration. No, double, triple, triple. Double, triple. Yeah. double periodic. Double periodic. Yeah, but in yes. very sense, this generic fiber is in complementary elliptic curve. Yeah, so actually, I don't. I think so, but I'm not fully sure if it's, yeah, I think so, yes. Yeah, they are just, yeah. So the point where it's elliptic fibrations they are like more than, uh, yes. Yeah, and it's just related to the fact that maybe from a physics point of view, this theory is really five dimensional. L like it's really like, it's like on five dimensional theory on S1. And in the usual story, like each system is just start with 4D and you go to 3D, there is a circle. So yeah, from 5D, there is two circles somehow. And if you exchange these two circles, you exchange these kind of two elliptic so structures. So it's either a discrete group action on the modulus space of Yeah, that's what I think. It's I think it's true that maybe there is some SL2Z lack action. I'm not sure, but I think so. Okay, so the point is that at least for a few points, we know explicitly what it is, at least as an, in fact, as an algebraic variety. I mean, it is, first of all, for these particular values, it is an algebraic variety, and uh, there is an explicit description, so I can just use some algebraic geometric tools to define and study holomorphic curves in these geometries. Okay, and now the statement would be that, for example, for pi over 2, you get this affine geometry, P2 minus E, and the claim is that this picture I draw here is indeed the correct picture with which capture holomorphic curves in the integral system. But the kind of basic relation that this thing is really some base of the integral system, or maybe a cover of the base. And the very rough uh, idea is that these kind of uh, curves are some kind of projection, or maybe tropical limit of projections of the holomorphic curve living in the total space of the integral system. And uh, 
And for this particular geometry, you can really, first of all, uh, make a precise algebra geometric definition of these numbers and prove that these numbers are indeed captured uh, by this picture. And the corollary of that is that you get some equality between, on the one side, dt invariance of local p2 of phase pi over 2. So for any point in the right part of this picture, the corresponding dt invariant can be described in something a pretty completely different as being some kind of curves in this uh, geometry. And maybe a comment that this kind of relation, so when people talk about dt invariance, sometimes they talk about correspondence with kind of curves. Maybe they talk about things like MNOP uh, conjecture. So this thing is really different. In this MNOP like conjecture, it's about dt invariance, which somehow capture curves, like ideal shifts or curves, or shifts depending on curves. I have some description in terms of maybe of witten theory on the same geometry. Yes, yeah, different. It's like all dt invariance. It can be about shifts of arbitrary rank on P2. And, and somehow the curve side is different. It has these holomorphic symplectic varieties, not on the same variety. And it's something I will not talk, but you can use this equality to prove various things. So actually, the curve side, if you define it algebra geometrically, actually has some very classical enumerative flavor. It's about rational curves in P2 with uh, imposed tangency conditions, so an elliptic curve. So it's some kind of classical enumerative geometry sounding kind of problem. And there was various kind of conjecture about these numbers. And once you e e equate them to some DT invariants, you have tools on the DT side somehow that you can use to solve this conjecture. Or you can go the other way, since there was various physics-related conjecture about these DT invariants, like modularity properties. And once you know that they are equal to some gromov witten like invariants, you can use techniques there to prove these kind of conjectures. So I will not talk about that, but there are like applications that you can have once you get these kind of uh, qualities. Okay, so this thing was for pi equal 2, for theta equal pi over 2, and you have a similar story for uh, theta equal to 0. So this picture, now the geometry is a really, an, it's almost a curve in the elliptic vibration now, really for complex structure for which the vibration is holomorphic, and you can count holomorphic curves there, and you can somehow prove that this picture capture the count of curves. Okay, so this thing was essentially the end of the kind of uh, concrete statement for this particular local P2 uh, geometry. On one hand, you have this geometrically defined it invariant, and for particular values of theta, you can indeed match these numbers to count of holomorphic curves. And I would just end by just a few like more speculative uh, slides, which are about uh, more general picture, not necessarily for, for local P2. So you could ask, you could ask more generally, why would you expect such connection between, on one hand, these DT invariants coming from uh, geometric objects on Calibre 3 fold, and on the other hand, this holomorphic curve in this cyberg witten uh, geometry. And, uh, and I will just end by some kind of physics like explanation. So, and, and which uses uh, the setting of holomorphic flow theory. So I guess we already heard from Konsevich and Summerman talk something about holomorphic flow theory because it's a proper context for resurgence and related uh, phenomena. So here just a single slide. So if you have something like a holomorphic or symplectic manifold and if you have some kind of compatible apicalis structure, I kept the same notation as before, but now in a more general context. And now if you have L1 and L2, two holomorphic Lagrangian inside this geometry, so I guess in Soberman's talk it was called L0 and L1. So they are I holomorphic, so omega I restricted to them is zero. Then you might consider the space of paths, infinite dimensional space of paths connecting these two Lagrangians. And on this uh, infinite dimensional complex manifold, you can define some uh, kind of holomorphic uh, function, the holomorphic action functional constructed by integrating the 
holomorphic symplectic form. Okay, so if you take a path of paths, you get a surface and you can integrate the holomorphic symplectic form on this surface, but this thing might depend on the path of paths, and so this thing could can be uh, multivalued. Okay, so maybe in general you want to go to some universal abelian cover of this geometry to get some uh, well-defined holomorphic function. And then, as it was discussed, you can uh, then do some kind of uh, infinite dimensional complex Morse theory or Foucault's idle type uh, construction. So in particular, out of this data, you have critical points of this functional, which are intersection points of L1 and L2. And you can consider gradient flow lines of like real part of this function or real part of this function rotated by, by a phase. And these gradient flow lines on this infinite dimensional space of paths translate into exactly J theta holomorphic curves in your holomorphic uh, symplectic geometry. And actually, if you want to do something like to push the analogy to do something like Fukaya Seidel categories, then we'd consider something like holomorphic curve in the space where the function is defined that. And if you translate it's like holomorphic curve in a space of paths, which would translate into some kind of three-dimensional object in your holomorphic symplectic manifold, and if you write down what it should be, it should be solution of this PDE, this footer-like equation. And then if you just follow the uh, analogy, if you have two intersection points, you should be able to construct out of it a vector space. Out of the two Lagrangian, you should be able to extract some kind of category, which is a kind of Foucault saddle-like category, and very, very speculatively, maybe out of M, all these categories are arranged in some kind of two categories, which is some kind of M model version of Rosansky with. Okay, so what's the point of all that? The point of all that is that somehow I want to explain, to state some kind of, make some kind of conjecture relating, so on one hand, the DT theory, or if you want BPS states of some four-dimensional theory, and on the other hand, the kind of holomorphic curves in the corresponding integral system, but I want to rephrase this holomorphic curve question in this holomorphic flare uh, language. So I have this point U in the base of my integral system, and I have this collection of omega gamma U, this BPS invariants, or DT-like invariants. And what I would like is to recover this number from some holomorphic flare construction on this M. So to make some holomorphic flare construction, I need two complex Lagrangians. So I need to tell you two complex Lagrangians. So there is one which is obvious, somehow this U is a point in the base. So I would simply take a fiber of the complex integral system. I would call L1 the fiber of this complex integral system, which is something which depends on U. And for the second one, I will take S, which is a section of this uh, fabrication. So maybe in complete generality, it's not completely clear what uh, this section is. For a thing like each in uh, system, it's supposed to be what is called each in section. And from the physics description of this M, there is some kind of the physics predicts there should be roughly a natural choice of a section. So roughly this M capture your four-dimensional theory compactified on some circle. And now if indeed you compactify your four-dimensional theory on this kind of cigar geometry, and if you let this circle shrink to a point, then this circle will shrink to some half line. And then this picture should translate into a picture where now this three-dimensional geometry maps to your, some kind of theory of maps from this 3D to your M. But now you have a natural boundary coming from this tip of the cigar and some of the corresponding boundary condition for the sigma model should be a Lagrangian inside your geometry, which is supposed to be a section. Okay, so here's a very rough uh, picture. I just put my point, a uh, fiber, which is actually a torus directly, and a section. And now I want to do holomorphic flow theory between these two Lagrangian. So maybe it sounds a little bit trivial because there is a single uh, intersection point. But the whole point is that the functional is multivalued. And it's multivalued precisely because its fiber is a torus as a non shoal pi 1. And so actually, if you go to the universal cover, or maybe some abelian version, actually it's exactly the universal cover under natural assumption, 
the group of transformation is exactly the group of classes for all morphic disks. And so the universal cover, your function really has some lattice of critical points. So which are the kind of picture we saw in many talks. Okay. And now the kind of conjecture that I state in some physics context, but then you can look at various examples, <coughs> like concrete mathematical example to see if it makes sense or not, that if you have this kind of four-dimensional theory for which you know some BPS states, let's say coming from geometry of some Calbio threefold, for example, and then if you pick a point Q, roughly the DT invariant or maybe some categorified version of it, you should be able to extract it from this holomorphic flow picture where this is vector space is extracted from holomorphic flow theory between two critical points of this uh, function of the universal cover. Okay, and so roughly uh, you can check that, at least if you forget the categorical aspect, if you just care about gradient flow lines, you recover J theta holomorphic disks, and so somehow you recover roughly the previous uh, expectation. And this thing is my uh, last slide, it's supposed to be some kind of physics derivation for why uh, this thing uh, should be true. So is that if you have some four-dimensional theory, you might compactify on this kind of Seagard geometry. And for the field, and you can restrict to field configuration which have charge gamma. And furthermore, you ask that at infinity, you are in the vacuum U. And then some of the state of like minimal energy here are more or less by definition the BPA states of charge gamma. On the other end, you can take the S1 to be very small. You get this kind of three-dimensional geometry. Now you have an interval. And now this thing, the description of this thing should be in terms of three-dimensional sigma model with target M. And there will be two boundary conditions. One thing, the vacuum is U, just translate into things the one boundary condition is a fiber U, and the other boundary condition should be the one coming from the tip of this cigar, which is supposed to correspond to this uh, section. Okay, and so some of the holomorphic flow picture will come from here. If you want, you can say, you also take the interval to be really small, and now this thing is like a two-dimensional series, some kind of Lando Ginzburg, exactly on the space of pass inside M, which is the holomorphic uh, flow theory uh, picture. So some other point of this picture is to try to argue why these kind of objects coming from his 4D theory, so it's expected they play some role in resurgence, and some kind of explanation for it is that they should have some holomorphic flare interpretation, and this thing is some kind of very just pictorial for why they have some holomorphic flare remaining. And I will stop there. Thank you for your attention. Are there questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, do you have any what will be other four-dimensional backgrounds okay. which can t start to interact with integral systems? And uh, yeah, from that extent, this cigar gives you a section. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Section. Yeah. Yes. And uh, is yes. anything else which you can say with other? If you input your theory in other. Yeah. Yeah. So, so actually, it's something that physicists do more often which is maybe they consider this cigar but they put some kind of they rotate the cigar like with some like half omega background like the, maybe they put some epsilon and maybe when you do that your section is deformed into the brain of opers which probably has to do with the quantization story but uh, yeah actually it's important that i don't put this epsilon i really take epsilon equal to zero that maybe pe people uh, because also the very fine to invariance which which is kind of, you use the invariants, we also have quantum torus, yeah? Yeah, 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 exactly. So, which is, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, but for more general, I, like, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, yeah, that's why you can try to play the game and just put, uh, yeah, that's why, so, yeah. Yeah, that's why, it's some kind of question that actually probably some physicists have been thinking about, like, what are the, Lagrangian, which has some lift in the four-dimensional theory. Ah, yeah, but this and is kind of uh, truly like cigar equivalent to the Yeah, but, but yeah, it's important. I, I don't put the Necrasov parameter. I take the Necrasov parameter to zero. I see. So, so it's related to some fixed theory. You need to take the limit epsilon equal to zero, and it's a very tricky limit actually because actually, yeah. So when epsilon is non-zero, mm -hmm. it's like holomorphic Lagrangian, not for this complex 
It's like holomorphic not for a complex structure i, but like roughly complex structure j. So when you do that, the brain, uh, so the section deforms into this brain of hoopers, but it's not clear how does its fiber deform because its fiber is like i holomorphic, but it's not. And usually when people put some omega background, they consider specific Lagrangian, like saying maybe that they have some, they construct like maybe coordinates coming from spectral network. Maybe they set half of the coordinate to zero. And it's one way to cook up nice Lagrangian, which are compatible with this omega background. And the expectation is that when epsilon goes to zero, it's something very singular happening, which is described in some paper of Jörg Teschner. I think that is kind of some manifold in the limit epsilon goes to zero, and they go to this fiber, which is a very singular limit. That is not really understood, I think. Well, can you yes, yeah. this categorical story of yes. slide? So, uh, yeah, uh, what, what kind of view the map? Sorry, uh, what map from any direction. For example, in, in your case, like KP, like if you would like to yes. verify, because yes. you prove that rigorous uh, numerator. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, how to map, I don't know, some uh, moduli space, I even don't know, it's cohomology, yeah, moduli space to, to some more complex. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So I think it's not really, uh, let me see. Yeah, that's right. You're asking if there's some kind of like natural map somehow, or like let's say if we pick like, for example, complexes on both sides. For example, yeah, because yeah, more or less. Yeah, just numbers uh, which are equal, but you're, is that like, vector spaces of complexes, we need yeah. to say they are maps somehow. And, yeah. and, uh, and I agree, it's not clear. Yeah. I mean, but I think, yeah, I mean, you could speculate uh, on your modus space of sheaves, you could try to take a model of your cohomology, some kind of math theory model of your cohomology. Uh, like, I think it's a kind of very rough idea. It should be, if you take some kind of, like maybe just real MOS function on your modus space, and, and then you you know only the scalabial potential which leads on the moduli space stack of all objects but it's yes different. yeah so i think you might imagine that if you really were able to perturb in some kind of random way like maybe you have finitely many points and then things connecting them and that is easier to match but i agree it's not clear at all in this section s mysterious it's kind of in general, you, you, you don't have... Yeah, I mean, generically, it's kind of c uh, clear in things where, where if, if it's really like a billion variety, it's, some, it's roughly like zero section. Like roughly, if there is a natural choice of zero section, it's just like zero section. Maybe the thing which is a bit mysterious is why is zero section somehow extend to the singular fiber somehow? I mean, definitely in the each system case, it is a case that the, generically, it's roughly some natural choice of zero section on the smooth part and yeah I mean some of there is some kind of geometric justice kind of explanation is telling yeah yeah I think in complete generality I don't know uh, what it is okay uh, more questions or comments so let's thank our speaker again okay.